Greetings from West Virginia uh, in United States. Uh, I'm delighted to present my talk on artificial intelligence and echocardiography. Uh, this is a very uh, important upcoming field in cardiac imaging, and uh, it's uh, perhaps going to change the way we are practicing uh, cardiac imaging and echocardiography. Uh, several years back, uh, almost about seven years back, um, I presented this uh, talk at the American Society of Echo where we uh, discuss the potential um, change that is going to happen in the near future with uh, bringing in of uh, big data analytics and use of machine learning and artificial intelligence and echocardiography. And you can see somewhere there and uh, around about that time, you start seeing an extreme enthusiasm uh, in the field of uh, using artificial in intelligence techniques in uh, echocardiography. And there's been an exponential growth subsequently what I didn't foresee seven years back when I was presenting was that this change is going to come so quickly that within four or five years, we're going to start using it in clinical practice. And that's right. Currently, believe it or not, we are using AI techniques. Uh, all of you are probably on the verge of using them in your clinical practice if you're not already using them. So this is an important area that requires uh, us to partake as the evolution is uh, happening in front of us. Now, what does an artificial intelligence mean? Well, artificial intelligence is a general term, a buzzword that is used for describing a machine's ability to perform human function. And uh, this a particular term has been there for several decades now, but only recently because of the uh, speeds of the computers have achieved a performance uh, that you can start using uh, them in regular work life. The term machine learning has come into place. Now, what does machine learning? Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence where the, the machine system, the algorithm is autonomous. It can learn on its own. So it has an ability to learn on its own and that is called as machine learning. And deep learning is further a subset of machine learning where uh, the architecture is bio-inspired by the working of the human neurons, the, the way uh, the neural circuits uh, work uh, together. And that's the area called as deep learning. Now, in the field of uh, machine learning, there are some other terms that are commonly used. And one such term is supervised learning. Supervised learning is a term where you first introduce the machine, the algorithm, to sets of labeled data. And it looks at the labeled data, understands the label, and learns on its own and develops a system that can recognize the labels. So you have to provide the labeled data set, and then the machine learning can develop an autonomous system to identify the labels. That's called a supervised learning. But there's also another field called as unsupervised learning, where there are no labels and the machine goes, algorithm goes, looks at the data, looks at the images, and tries to make interpretation. And most of the time, the interpretation is in terms of pattern recognition. It tries to identify certain sets of pattern and says, well, I'm seeing in this sets of images a specific pattern that is imaging. And that leads to a binning or grouping of these pattern, or what is called as clustering of the data. So unsupervised learning is another way to look at an unlabeled data to identify unique patterns and pattern recognition or unique cluster of patients or cluster of objects. Now, this is very similar to how human intelligence evolves. When a child is introduced into a new environment, a lot of the learning happens in an unsupervised way. It goes around, explores the environment, looks at the objects, and without even any supervision, learns to understand the world. So there's unsupervised learning. And on top of that, the um, parents and, and mentors, they provide supervised learning, you know, identifying objects and telling them that this is what is a labeled information. So there is a supervised learning on top of that. And further on top of that, there is reinforcement learning where you reward uh, or punish the child for a certain type of activity. So this also called as reinforcement learning. So same way in the machine, you can actually reinforce uh, the learning uh, by rewarding the algorithm 
or punishing the algorithm for the mistakes it makes. So that's called as a reinforcement learning. And there are some many other such categories. So you can see the analogy between human intelligence and machine intelligence is fairly uh, similar. Now, how is AI techniques or machine learning changing the field of echocardiography and what's going to happen? Number one is uh, machine learning is very appropriate for uh, taking in the information and understanding the patient's presentation. So if you have ECG data, clinical data, symptoms, so on and so forth, you can take all that information together and build a patient's uh, need for further testing. So this way, machine learning probably could be useful for understanding the appropriateness for doing an echocardiogram. Most of the time, you know, people hear a murmur or un look about a reason for finding, uh, performing an echocardiogram, and you subsequently perform an echocardiogram as a normal study. So it's a wasted time when you are referring a patient for a normal echocardiogram. So could we make develop processes in which only appropriate testing can be done. And that could be one of the ways to advance machine learning. And this is some of the work we did recently in which you can take, for example, a, a simple uh, tool like an ECG, which has been there for a long time, but extract more information beyond what is known. Uh, and this is a, basically a signal processing that has been uh, performed. And from all the features that come from signal processing that you can feed into a computer and train it for, for the testing. And in this particular example, we trained it to identify patients with heart failure, diastolic dysfunction, an appropriate referral for patients who have got diastolic heart failure. And it performed well. So in the same way, you can understand, uh, you can integrate information before the testing is done and develop tools and pathways for appropriate referral for the patient. The second place where uh, machine learning is uh, helping is in the field of uh, workflow and efficiency in the lab. Now you have deep learning techniques that can automatically characterize, classify the images. And this is a work which was uh, done uh, by Remar Notch Lab and UCLA where you, know, you can see uh, from clusters of images, they could be binned into different categories or different uh, views automatically by a machine learning algorithm. It identif automatically identified the views. And in fact, in this particular study, there's a very interesting uh, comparison with board certified uh, echocardiographers. In fact, the machine learning's ability to identify the views trumped uh, that of board certified uh, echocardiographers. Particularly, think about the end of the day and you're fatigued and you're looking at the images and you're trying to go through the images and you can make mistakes. So. Uh, such mistakes would not happen if you augment yourself using a machine learning algorithm. That would be what would be uh, useful. And then we had another study where we showed that when we use such automated tools, it improves your efficiency. You can use uh, these automated tools for doing manual contouring, deriving volumes, ejection fractions, with high accuracy and very quickly without putting this labor intensive work. So that brings in efficiency into your workflow and your lab. Not only just simple echocardiographic measurements, uh, contouring and segmenting and measurements. You can do complex processes like uh, performing regional wall motion abnormality analysis, which is perhaps a higher caliber work and has a lot of variability and a lot, a lot of people may not recognize subtle wall motion abnormality. This work, the Everest trial, which is uh, being done in the United Kingdom, looked into the ability of uh, uh, machine learning tools to automate uh, wall motion analysis and stress echocardiogram and look at the remarkable area under the curve and diagnostic ability. Just to give an example, this is a picture from the same Everest trial. You can see how the uh, stress echocardiogram images, uh, wall motion contours are automatically segmented. So this tracking is being done automatically without any human input and the borders are being found out very well. And then not only the tool is able to look into and track the uh, wall motion from the left ventricle, but it can actually adjust to the variability that comes in the clinical practice. For example, this is a, this is a, a task where it is trying to find out the wall motion and abnormality from the left ventricle. And the, the, the sonographer has just moved and you can see the image which was actually not a, 
uh, view of the left ventricle initially jumped from the right ventricle, but it was able to get in and find out the left ventricle. So again, it has an intelligence not to get diverted towards the right ventricle or other chambers, but actually find the left ventricle and track it properly. So uh, this automated view recognition and quality assessment steps um, uh, and ability to track and perform wall motion uh, assessment could be very helpful for a novice who is not used to the images and who is not used to performing wall motion uh, analysis in daily clinical practice. And this could be a great um, way to standardize the wall motion uh, analysis in clinical uh, practice. Machine learning is extremely uh, useful for connecting the dots and finding the nonlinear or uh, the, the the trends in the data for for predicting the outcomes. In fact, it's probably uh, going to be a better way for risk stratification and taking all the information from echocardiography to, for predicting which patient is likely to have mortality, which patient is likely to get into CCU, which patient is likely to present with an acute coronary event. So these kind of mortality prediction and high risk prediction so as to be able to risk stratify your given patient an individual patient is what machine learning does very well. And this particular study, which was published in uh, Jack Imaging, um, uh, looked into uh, data sets, uh, uh, echocardiographic data sets for developing um, uh, mortality prediction. And obviously the machine learning algorithm was superior to many other currently scoring uh, uh, scores that are currently used like Framingham risk score or the ACC uh, risk scoring. Um, and, and it was uh, superior to many of the standard uh, uh, algorithms are, that are currently utilized. So machine learning is going to be extremely useful for risk uh, prediction. And finally, not only just risk prediction, but also it can connect the information. Uh, it can look at the images, it can contour the images, it can extract the measurements. It can make the measurements and make a decision. Well, is it a hypertrophy or is it a amyloid or is it a constriction or is it a restriction? Such complexity of information can, can also be taken in for developing phenotypic uh, understanding of the disease presentation. And that can be used uh, for augmenting your decision support. So when you're opening up and trying to report, it will auto automatically give you suggestion. Well, this looks like a hypertrophy. This has a features of amyloid and so on and so forth. So this ability to augment your decision uh, when you're reporting an echocardiogram is also another uh, uh, feather in uh, a lot of the tasks that uh, currently machine learning is capable of performing. In fact, this work, particular work, uh, which was published in circulation by Rahul Day and colleagues, um, uh, had uh, ability to completely automate the echocardiographic e evaluation interpretation and had a fairly, fairly strong uh, diagnostic ability to predict uh, conditions like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or uh, detecting the presence of pulmonary hypertension. And this is the wave of, of the future in which we are going to be able to augment our decision and standardize our decisions and also do it at a fast pace, particularly in busy practice like in India, you can use some of these tools to automate and make standardized decisions so that there is no variability in clinical practice, which currently is a big challenge in many parts of the world. And finally, uh, another area which is becoming very relevant is to extract new knowledge, new information. For example, uh, looking into uh, data uh, in terms of uh, echocardiography, uh, Doppler-based data, and, and grayscale data, and connect the data so that the information from simple grayscale images can pr provide you information that is, would otherwise come from uh, information like uh, uh, hemodynamic Doppler measurements. So in a way, for understanding the knowledge from grayscale, 2D dimensional data and extracting more information that has uh, ability to uh, improve the workflows and efficiency. And this is a work which was done in which simple grayscale data was from without the use of Doppler could come close to what would come from Doppler based examination. So simple grayscale 2D images provided the same abilities to extract information, uh, provide an ability to perform diastolic function assessment with an area under the curve that otherwise uh, uh, would come only from Doppler-based uh, assessment. So you can see here extracting information from simple data sets, which will be otherwise available from higher caliber uh, undertakings. That's a, another uh, ability of machine learning algorithms. For example, taking just a simple 
grayscale data that comes from 2D images. And this work from Dr. Uh, Kagiyama from my group extracted the texture from the 2D images and connected that texture to uh, the MRI uh, level information. And that would uh, uh, allow you to connect uh, 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 an information if a patient with a certain type of echocardiogram would be better served for referral for MRI because there is presence of fibrosis. So this is simple grayscale information, texture, uh, and that we are extracting information to understand presence or absence of myocardial fibrosis. Uh, so you can see here how echocardiogram can be uh, elevated to prov provide information that would otherwise come only from tools like myocardial uh, uh, MRI imaging and so on. Connecting the data, integrating the data from uh, diagnostic elements from biochemical uh, and making sense of the data uh, this is something that uh, AI uh, can do and in fact it's started introducing a new area where uh, the taxonomy of cardiology the way we define diseases is currently going to be changed uh, you can take all the plethora of data that comes from cardiac imaging and connect it for making more information for example Think about diastolic dysfunction. Diastolic dysfunction is a condition which has so many measurements that can be taken. And currently, the guidelines are suggesting us to go through difficult pathways. Can we simplify the whole process? And we did that. Well, in fact, let's ask a question. Just like uh, diastolic dysfunction, uh, can you measure diastolic dysfunction directly? The answer is, uh, let's draw a corollary. Can you measure mental depression? Well, actually, you cannot directly measure mental depression. You can know the presence of depression based upon presence of many such attributes like suicidal thoughts, low concentration, sleeping problems, so on and so forth. In the same way, uh, you cannot directly measure a myocardial a depression or dis uh, dysfunction because it is a latent feature, just like just like when you uh, when. Uh, Newton explained gravity. Gravity, can you measure gravity? No, you can't measure gravity. You can measure motion. So you measure motion and refer for the presence of something called as a gravity, which is a latent behavior. Same way Darwin spoke about presence of genes. At the time, genes was not measurable. So it was a latent behavior. Same way uh, diastolic dysfunction is a latent behavior of the myocardium, which you cannot directly measure, but you can see by the presence of different features. And these features, many of them are labeled, many of them are not labeled. So when you look into the field of unlabeled data sets in echocardiography and you use unsupervised learning to aggregate this unlabeled data set, you can understand for the presence or absence of diastolic dysfunction, which is a latent behavior. And we did that uh, uh, latent analysis. Uh, and in this particular study, we perform unsupervised learning of different features of echocardiogram and we were connect uh, able to connect that to the latent behavior of the patients in terms of their clinical survival and this particular latent analysis unsupervised analysis is called as uh, topological network analysis we then fed into deep learning uh, algorithms uh, to, for automated detection of diastolic dysfunction and here is the data from top cat study where heart failure preserve ejection fraction was uh, uh, evaluated with spironolactone and the deep learning uh, network that we developed was able to risk stratify the patients and this was validated and this particular work actually went on to uh, win just this year the NHLBI big data challenge uh, and is going to be freely available this particular classifier is going to be made freely available that was developed in my lab for identifying patients of uh, diastolic dysfunction just you will have to input the data and it will tell you whether it's a high risk or a low risk and that way we will be able to evolve finally there is a big uh, move towards uh, developing synthetic patients so you can take real patients and from that you can develop just the mirror image patients are called as synthetic patients and you can run the clinical trials in synthetic clinical patient uh, you can take the data from echo and ct construct the images uh, into a real uh, uh, into a in the, into a synthetic environment, treat that treat that synthetic data and develop devices and so on and so forth. So this is a big push from the FDA and machine learning is going to play a very important role as we uh, evolve in in what is called as the digital twin studies in which we will develop twin data sets and we will evolve from there onwards. Uh, this is again taking the 
uh, fluid mechanics data from echocardiography, putting them into uh, such synthetic data and evolving such hemodynamic uh, equations and, and synthetic data used for developing devices and therapy in, in, in synthetic environment. And this is going to be a ma major push. Finally, answering the question, will we be replaced? The answer is no, we are not going to be replaced. We are going to be augmented, but AI augmented echocardiographers will replace echocardiographers or images who are not going to be augmented. So please partake in this evolution, start using these tools because your life will be better and you'll have better abilities to me medical decision making. So how do we use machine learning in 2020 for echocardiography? Free up your time from repeated, low level, uneventful activities that you don't like to do. Let the machines do something that is boring and mundane and you can evolve yourself for high caliber work for medical decision making. And more importantly, connecting back to the patient so that you can discuss the solutions, you can get back the time to be able to do that, which is the biggest problem. Currently, we don't have time for really taking care of our patients. So in that way, we'll be able to evolve and take our uh, work to a newer and a different level of activities that will allow us to have also work satisfaction in the field that we belong to. Thank you very much.